and we built a, a couple of vehicles that you might have heard about, uh, Priuses, uh, much leaner than the vehicles we had before, uh, much better equipped to be lightweight and, and uh, easy to maintain. Uh, and here's some footage from those vehicles that we uh, since recorded all on Thomas Drive. We decided to go away from uh, staging grounds to the real cities. This is San Francisco, where you deal with challenges like joggers and intersections. This is a fast forward of a toll booth and a busy highway. You see downtown Monterey with pedestrians. And this is all done with self driving cars and no one noticing that there's a self driving car. In fact, for more than a year, I drove these cars daily, many of those cars. And no one had a clue what's going on until the New York Times finally found out about the story. Drove at night and even drove down crooked Lombard Street in San Francisco. This is a little fast forward, you don't drive that fast. Um, but we had lots of tourists that participate in our research at this time. <laughs> Basically, um, we decided to try to drive everywhere you can drive uh, with a car in California. Um, here is um, a test bit of a thousand miles that we carved out to ourselves for the thousand mile challenge. And our first um, thing we tried to achieve was to drive these 1,000 miles completely hands off. Uh, you can't be driving in one stretch because of the fatigue that the safety driver behind the wheel. So we chopped them into approximately 100 mile segments and drove those entirely hands off. And if you live in San Francisco or Los Angeles, uh, some of the terrain is really hard. Um, like on the top left here, we're crossing the mountains, Santa Cruz Mountains, to a small city called La Honda, to the beach, Highway 1 up north, downtown San Francisco, Lombard Street, back to Market Street all entirely hands off. There was always a safety driver on board, but the safety driver and the computer operator never interfered. We drove from Mountain View all the way to Los Angeles, we drove around Lake Tahoe, we drove all the major bridges in the Bay Area, we drove El Camino Real from San Francisco to San Francisco with over 200 traffic lights, entirely hands off. Uh, that's what we're up to, and Chris tell you, will tell you how we did it. So, uh, with us, you know, the, the most physical part of the, vehicle, uh, the system, of course, is the car. So, as Sebastian said, there's a lot less stuff in our vehicles. So, after going through the Urban Challenge, we were able to learn a lot about what was necessary and what kind of capabilities we would want on a vehicle. So, we were able to break this out to just having uh, four radars, one front and back, one left and right, that allows us to see a, far enough to be able to merge with traffic, to be able to deal with uh, traffic moving at speed on the freeways. We have the laser on the top of the vehicle, which came from Velodyne, which is, again, one of these success stories out of the Darker Challenge. They're a company that decided a thing that was missing in the challenge was a really good sensor. So they built one and then sold it. We used it on one of the teams that we used with Google. We, of course, have GPS. As Sebastian said, we always run our vehicles with two people on board. And then we have computing and whatnot that actually sits in the, uh, where the spare wheel would sit in the back of the car. Uh, so it's, it's a fair step forward from what we've had in the past. And of course, having been part of the red team with the giant fin and the flag, we had to have an awesome spoiler on the top of the cruise. The heart of our system really is the, the data that we get from the, the laser. The 64 beam laser generates about a million and a half measurements per second. It allows us to see all the way around the vehicle and it allows us to get a fairly high density of points. So here you're looking at the, you know, what that raw data looks like. So we're driving down some street here, you can pick out the vehicles, you can pick out the poles. You see how the data decreases in, uh, uh, in density as we get farther away, just because of the, you know, the angular factors. Uh, here's the pedestrian, you can see them nice and clear. Once we have this data, we can then take the data uh, and the post system, we can run SLAM across the two, we can generate very high resolution maps of the world. So here we are driving our vehicle on the road, collecting the uh, intensity, the kind of the, the infrared reflectivity of the road, and using that to build a texture model of the world. We take the, we, so the, whoa, go back, get a little excited here. Uh, so there's, there's actually four types of data we build from this. So I talked about the intensity models. Uh, on the top right here, we have an elevation model. So everywhere the vehicle can drive, we've mapped ahead of time to about 11 centimeters uh, resolution the shape of the world. We use this in the perception system. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. In the bottom right, we have lane level maps of the world. We can go through our data and extract where the car should you drive and use that as a prior for our control and also for estimating the movement of other vehicles. And on the bottom left, we have what we call the staticness map. 
this is a model of what in the world do you expect to move. If you drive through a scene multiple times, you compare the snapshots, you can see what things are stationary and what aren't. We, allow, we use that to allow us to do a better job of classifying pedestrians, say, versus poles or mailboxes. I mentioned quickly uh, the lane level maps. One of the things that we're pretty excited about is the idea we don't have to hand click through all of our data. So we've done a fair bit of uh, algorithmic work, machine learning work, to be able to pull out features from the road to be able to pick out where the driving lane is from this data. So it works obviously really well on highways that are well structured, but what you might be surprised is we do a pretty good job on curvy, windy roads like this bit of, I think this is page mail, uh, going up the Santa Cruz Mountains. Once we have detailed maps, we can use them to figure out where the car is in the world. So by taking the laser data, generating a 2D map with the intensity of that, and then running a correlation of that versus the map we built a priori, we can then pass that as the perception measurement into a co or into, into some kind of filter. Here we're running a particle filter to figure out where in the world the vehicle really is. And that allows us to understand where it is very, very precisely. The resolution of our maps is about 11 centimeters to the dimension. We can actually do sub-pixel resolution uh, positioning from that. Obviously, that's critically important. If you consider the alternative of using just you know, GPS to estimate your location in the world, you can be off by three to five meters very easily. Uh, and uh, if you try to use some kind of augmentation system like eGPS, you're going to have dropouts in the places where you care about it most in dense urban environments and whatnot. The other thing we do with the maps is we use them to segment what's, what's there all the time in the physical world and what's moving on top of that world. So here you can see us picking out uh, pedestrians, cars, even cyclists, clustering those together into these blobs. And, and then in a moment here, I'll show us tracking them. The key, I, the key insight here, though, is that we're using our model of the world, our a prior model of the world. We're looking for the things that effectively stick out of that, and we're calling those things of interest. Once we have blobs that stick out of the world, we then cluster them and track them over time. We do some, uh, eat for each of the elements here, we're running a, uh, a you know, Gaussian tracker. Uh, on top of that, we're doing very precise uh, matching between kind of the, the shape of the blob in the past and the shape of the blob in the present. And that allows us to do a really nice orientation, as you saw with that car cutting in on the um, right there, and be able to track these uh, vehicles precisely enough to drive them. You can do this. One of the other things we put into our map is the traffic controls in the world, and then we exploit that in real time to see the state of them. So here we're driving up to an intersection with traffic lights. We can see the traffic lights at distance. We uh, are detecting them. You can see it put the blue box. That's the prediction window of where we expect to see a traffic light, and the red highlight and now green highlight are showing in real time we're detecting the actual state of that traffic light. This reduces the search space that we have to look over to find the traffic lights in the image and it allows us to more robustly detect them and drive in traffic. I mentioned that we use a prior on where the vehicle should drive, uh, these, these lane level maps. Of course, as you're driving along, you can't just stick to the center of the lane. Humans don't drive down the center of the lane, and there's often stuff like the cyclist you see here on the right that sticks into the road that you need to adapt uh, your trajectory for. So we do that in two different ways. One is we can slide the trajectory around under the vehicle, basically call that nudging. The other is we can run an optimization in real time that optimizes both the smoothness of the trajectory and its uh, distance from obstacles. And then we can follow that uh, gracefully at speeds, uh, you know, up, to, up to freeway speeds. Finally, putting this all together, this is what the system looks like from the, the car's point of view. So it's pulling up to an intersection here. It, uh, it's looking for the traffic lights. It's identified the traffic light as red. It's tracking the cross traffic and seeing the vehicles come forward, uh, uh, coming towards us here. You can see the laser data detecting, or the laser data is showing pedestrians on the side of the road. They start to become interesting when they step into the road. So here we're making a assertive left turn. We see the pedestrians, we're yielding to them. And then this guy who decides last minute to run across the road, we see him continue to yield to him, and then go on our way. So what does this look like from outside the car? Here's the vehicle driving through downtown Palo Alto. Uh, it's able to come to a stop, wait for the traffic light. Here it goes. 
it sees some other pedestrians on the road, waits for them to clear, and then off it goes again. So we, we do thank the uh, citizens of California for helping validate the system. Uh, we've done an awful lot of testing with our vehicles over the last uh, few years. And from that, we've, we've seen a few things that are pretty interesting. One of them is intersection behavior. So if you read the DMV handbook for how to traverse an intersection, it sounds, it sounds awesome, right? You pull in, you stop, you wait for the person to your right, you wait for the person in front of you, you wait for the person to your left, then you go, and you know, it's just, it's a state machine, right? It's done, bang, this is robotics at its best. Of course, real driving isn't like that. Uh, you know, as you pull up, the other people are kind of taking turns and they're, they're, they're zipping across traffic when they think they can fit. And if you actually waited as you're supposed to in the DMV, you wouldn't get any, uh, in the DMV handbook, you wouldn't get anywhere. So what we've encoded in the system is the ability to kind of to, to uh, follow the rules and then adapt to what's going on in the road. So here we come to a stop sign, we see a pedestrian crossing the road in front of us, we yield to them. We see the person waiting to make a left turn. We still don't think it's our turn to go yet, so we have uh, the, the stop sign in front of us here. We're now shooting off these lasers. These are the vehicles we're tracking that we think we now need to yield to, even though it's our turn. They've kind of already moved in the intersection. Now we start a stage where we're a little more assertive, and we say, we're going to go. This allows the vehicle to signal to the other drivers that it's traversing the intersection, that it's its turn. And then it waits a little bit, as you saw at the end there, and it goes through. Here's another one. Uh, this is typical San Francisco drivers. This is the Presidio, not far from here. Uh, <coughs> we follow a vehicle in. There's a bit of traffic here. We're, we're waiting at the stop sign. We decide it's our turn to go. Car goes. We're patiently waiting. OK, we decide to go. This guy in an SUV decides it's his turn to go, despite us moving forward. We slow down, yield to them, and then continue through the intersection. Finally, having driven 190,000 miles at this point, you see a lot of interesting things on the road. So here we're driving along the, the 280 freeway. We come across a truck and a guy deciding to merge into the freeway. He's not looking. He's on a cell phone or something. Decides, oh my goodness. Uh, and then uh, you know, has a little bit of excitement in his day. Uh, we, of course, went back and checked and the guy was fine. Uh, you know, it, he, he actually was moved on. He was gone. So all is well. Uh, but one of the things that we're, we're fighting with, and the robotics will fight with, of course, is these very rare events that, uh, that happen on the freeway and happen when you're driving around other vehicles. So from that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sebastian. So we also have fun. And, and not necessarily public streets as much as Occasionally, when we go to little close-up areas, this is Chris. Feeling very confident. Feeling still confident. Um, and it's all about <laughs> the <laughs> 